I want to speak a word of encouragement. It's not a, it's not a big sermon, but I want to speak something that God spoke to me over the last uh, couple of weeks. And uh, this has been in my heart, and God gave me this word. And this has encouraged me, and I want to share this to you as an encouragement this morning, as an encouragement for this new year. I don't know what you're going through, but God is sovereign and he knows what you're going through. Amen. He knows you personally. Isn't that something to know? That he knows you personally and inside out. And he wants to have a relationship and he wants to be in your life. And I want to open up to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10 to 11. If you have your Bible, 1 Peter verse 5, chapter 5 is where we are going to uh, uh, look in this morning. And... Uh, but chapter, uh, verse 10 to 11 is our main scripture. And uh, if you open it up, it says like this. And the God of all grace, and the God of all grace who calls you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a while, will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. It says, and the God of all grace, who calls you to eternal glory, to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a while, after you have suffered a while, will himself, it's not like everybody who suffered come together, I'm going to bless you together. No, will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Another translation, it says, firm, and he will establish you. He will establish you. Restore you. Make you strong. Firm, and he will establish you. Which means he'll put you on a firm foundation. I don't know how many, how many of you have to hear this word this morning. I don't know how you came into this new year, into 2024. But I believe God is speaking to you this morning that he will make you, he will restore you. Whatever has been broken in your life, whatever has been, when nobody could make it back together, he will restore it back together. And I want to speak this hope in your, in this, in your life this morning that he will give you strength that the world cannot give you. And he will make you firm and he will establish you. When I say firm and establish, it means nobody can shake it because you're standing on the stone, you're standing on the rock that is Jesus Christ. When you're standing on him, nobody can shake it, amen? Are you with me this morning? Nobody can shake it, nothing. Whatever you feel, whatever you might be here thinking about the future, what, how you wanted 2024 to be like, but the, the truth is that it is not what you thought it would be like but God is sovereign, and he said after a small time of suffering, he will restore you, and he will strengthen you, and he will make you firm, and he will establish you. Let's pray. God, thank you for this word. Thank you that you're sovereign. Thank you for your promise. Those are yes and amen. We believe it in. And speak to us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Peter is writing this uh, this letter to the church in Asia Minor, to a people who are going through persecution and suffering. They're going through hardship because they believe in Jesus. They're going through a tough time because of their belief. They believe that Jesus, they, they came from their old ways, from old, from their old, uh, from their old um, lifestyle, from serving their, the worldly, worldly things, serving the gods of the world into knowing and understanding Jesus and baptizing in him and receiving the Holy Spirit. Now the world hates him, but hates them because of their belief. And Peter, in First Peter, I, I would encourage you to read it again if you haven't. Uh, it's, it's a letter of encouragement to the church who are going through persecution and suffering. And he's telling them towards the end of this letter, to the end of this epistle, he's telling them, after a while of suffering, after a while of suffering, I know God is saying, he knows what you're going through. He knows what you're going through. He knows what I'm going through. He knows what, what, what lays ahead of us. And after this while of suffering, he will restore you. He will strengthen you. And he will make you firm and found, firm and establish you.
Psalm 23 says, Psalm 23, David says, he will restore my soul. There's nobody in this world who can restore other than Jesus, who has given you the promise that he will restore and he will restore my soul. Whatever the brokenness is, whatever the pain is, whatever your thought or anxiety or about the future, about your career, about whatever financial, whatever it is, maybe it is your family, maybe it is your relationship, he is able to restore you. Amen? Amen. He is able to restore you, and he is able to make you strong. But uh, when before the before God asked before God let the people of Israel into the promised land, into the promised land, God said something to Joshua. He said to Joshua, "Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go." I want you to take this personally. Be strong and courageous because it is not just your will, but it is God who's making you strong. So he's telling you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed, be dismayed because I am with you wherever, wherever you go, wherever you go. And to David, he said, in, in First Chronicles chapter 14, verse 2, he said, And David knew that the Lord had established him as a king. And David knew the Lord had established him as a king over Israel, and that his kingdom had been highly exalted for the sake of his people, Israel. If God establishes you, nobody can shake you. Nobody can change you. Nobody can move you. Nobody can, can tell you anything else other than what the promise of the Lord has given to you. God is speaking to you today wherever you are at your life. He is going to make you firm. I'm going to repeat this whole day because this has been the life of my, this has been, this has been the hard rot through the last couple of, last month that God has been given. Through this hardship, God said, after a while of suffering, the God of all grace, grace that we never thought we would deserve, but the grace of God, because of the grace of God, he will. And the title of my message today is God of all grace. Wow. The God of all grace. Now, Peter is writing this letter, and he is saying, and the God, and the God of all grace. So he's continuing something that he's been talking. He's writing to them, right? Now, if you open up your Bible to chapter 1 Peter chapter 5, I'm going to read from one, verse 1 to verse 4. And this he's writing towards the end. He is giving encouragement to the pastors and leaders of the church. And it says like this, verse 1. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will suffer in glory to be revealed. Be shepherd of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must be, not, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not loading it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So he's writing this to the, as an encouragement to the pastors of the church. How many of you believe, how many of you know that we have the best pastors? Pastor Scott and Pastor Phil, amen? And, and Suzanne and Megan, the kids. To be a pastor of the church is something big. It's, a, it's not an easy job. And it's amazing. And he's given them an encouragement. And Peter goes on to verse 5. He says, in the same way, you who are younger, it's everybody. <laughs> you who are younger, submit yourself to your elders. All of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another. Because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. I believe God, I believe Peter is right in this here to let you know that for God to restore you and make you strong, it requires you to be able to submit to the elders, submit to one another, and be humble. Because these qualities are not of manly quality, because we are sinners. And we need to be humble. We need to learn how to be humble. And I believe these go hand in hand. Submission and humility goes hand in hand. Cannot be humble and say, oh, I don't need anybody's counsel. 
You know what I mean? You cannot be humble and say, eh, I don't care what he says or what my pastor says. I don't care about it. You cannot be submissive and say, I'm prideful. You cannot, because those go hand in hand. And Paul and, 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 and Peter is here saying that be, sub, be submissive to elders and also be humble. Clothe yourself with humility. Now, Peter is writing to the church to people who are going through persecution and suffering. You need to know when there is a lot of things going around you and the enemy is attacking you, it is easy for us to go and not take decision on our own or make, make things happen. But God is asking, be humble. Don't do any actions out of your own emotion, but humble enough and submit and let God take over. Amen? And the best, one of the best examples, a couple of few examples are Paul and Timothy. Paul and Timothy was just a young man when he started following Paul and Silas. And towards the end, Paul, whenever Paul writes, Paul writes it like this. Paul in Christ Jesus, Paul and Timothy. So he is included in this because of Timothy's heart of teachability and also his heart of learning and to be under his leader, Paul. And God God, God honors your submission and humility. It doesn't mean that to be submissive under, under, bad, under bad influence, but to be under your own church. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2 says, with humility comes wisdom. And 2 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 4, one of those famous scriptures where we often uh, quote says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So for God to do anything, he requires, if my people are called by my name, will humble themselves. I believe the first part is not to know that I can do everything but to know that I cannot do everything without God. It's to know that God is sovereign over your life, over, your, over our city, over our, over our province, over our nation, over our world. God is sovereign. And to know that, God, I humble myself towards you. I know the chaos happening outside. I know the chaos happening inside our family. But God, I submit unto your heart, unto your feet. I humble myself in your hands, Lord. Paul and Timothy, and uh, one of the greatest examples, another example is Joseph. God gave Joseph the dream that his parents and his brothers will come and bow down to him. And he knew this was from God, but his character did not change. His, his way of learning, his way of being submitted, submission to his, 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 his boss or his, his employees or his faithfulness towards God did not change. Even for Samuel, in 1 Samuel, uh, when, when you read that David was anointed to be the king of Israel, even when Saul was still the king of Israel, he did not overtake Saul's position. He went under and he served Saul, even though he knew God anointed him as the king. He had a heart that knew that God would lift him, at the, lift him up at the right moment. And Peter continues to say this in verse 6. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, then he may, that he may lift up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I feel like there's two side kinds of like humility that God, Peter is talking about. Humble, humility between one another and hum, humility uh, under, coming under God's mighty hand. And God requires that for him to restore you and to make you strong. Because he cannot restore you because if you, if you don't cast all your anxiety on him and if you cast all your anxiety on him, yourself and thinking that you can provide for your family, you can solve this relationship crisis, whatever that is going on, I can do it. I was in that same boat trying to think over God that I can do this. I have just have to work every day, do this and do that and try to do this. Uh, take two jobs, take three jobs and work it out. And I can provide for whatever is happening to me or provide whatever is happening back home. I can, I can take care of myself. But God is telling you, trust my life with God and he will take care of you. For God to restore you, you got to make room for him. 
You got to make room. That's why it says, cast all your anxiety on him. Because he cares for you. Peter is saying to a church that is going through persecution, stop trying on your own to solve everything. A, a church that is going through suffering because, they, because of their belief, because of the good things that they do, the church is going through suffering. And, uh, and Peter is saying, stop trying. Stop, stop going out and just, say, just, just, just cast your trouble at God's hands. And he will take on because he cares for you. What does he do? He cares for you. Most of us, sometimes I try to figure out, okay, I didn't tell this example yesterday. I don't know why this came into my mind this morning. And this is very vulnerable. Maybe I shouldn't tell. Uh, <laughs> I should, I should, I should. My parents are watching this, so. <laughs> you know, as you get older, you want to you, you want, you move ahead in your life, right? Like, you get married and... Right? <laughs> you know where I'm going with this? Are you engaged? No, 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 I'm not. <laughs> but uh, you try to do, but sometimes God will tell you, stop doing it. He's working something in you. He's working something in you. Are you ready to receive what God is working in something in you before you rush towards something? Amen. God has called you to a purpose and he will not... He will, he will finish what he started in you. There's a purpose that God has given you. Don't rush it. Cast all your anxiety on him. Whatever you're thinking, that is called submission and humility. Because humility is not saying, oh, I'm not thankful. Just submit and say, God, here I am. I, 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 I stopped working on my own. I stopped, I stopped, I've stopped trying. Well, you can keep trying, but God, I stopped. Uh, this is all in your hand. I'm going to be faithful with what you have given me. I remember, uh, this is not on my note, but I remember one, one, one time, once uh, I was trying to do everything and uh, Phil called me to his office and gave me, showed me this post of this uh, billboard that said, be the spark of the world. And there's this uh, red line that's crossed it out and said, be faithful what, whatever you are, you have, God has given you. Don't be the spark of the world. Just be faithful what God has given you. He will... Because that is saying that you have been humble enough to submit to God and do whatever he is asking you to do. So for God to restore you and make you strong, it requires you to submit and be humble. See where I'm going? God of all grace has called you and he himself will restore you and make you strong. Even through our brokenness, just be submission, submitted to God and be humble. Verse 5, chapter 5, verse 8 to 9. Then it says, Be alert of sober mind and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Peter is saying, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. He's roaring, but stand firm. Stand firm in your faith. First is submission, clothed in humility. Second is to stand firm. When I first moved to Victoria, Scott Jansen used to take me out for uh, hike, heights, right? He used to go out for hike out and... Um, we went, we went for a hike one time, a couple of times, and then after they moved, I tried to go on a hike on my own. And, and we, I went to Mount Doug all the way up. It was fantastic, right? Came down. It was getting dark. I mean, not dark, but like the sun was setting. So the trees it was getting like darker, right? And uh, I heard in the bush, shh. <laughs> all of a sudden, this thought came into my mind there might be cougars <laughs> waiting to devour you. <laughs> that word did not happen to me, but I'm just saying that, right? I was, I was sweating. I was ready to run, looking 360 degree, and I know if cougar is looking at you, you don't know it. So you're looking all the way, and you're ready to run. Nobody's around, right? 
But out of this bush came this animal, and I screamed. That was just a dog. <laughs> it was a lab. Without leash, running out. <laughs> the devil is roaring like a lion, ready to devour. So what do we have to do? Peter is saying to a church that is persecution, going through persecution, saying there's, a, there's an enemy going around you and the, and the same thing is happening to every people, all believers across every nation, whoever believes in Jesus, is, they're going through the same persecution and the enemy is, is, is going around looking for people. The, 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 the answer to the question Peter is saying is, what should we do? Resist him. Standing firm in faith. Standing firm in faith. How do we stand firm in faith? In the word of God. In two, the, September 2008, there was a hurricane named Ike that hit Texas and hit everything that came in its way and it's, it wept everything that came in its way. But there's this town called Gilcrest that hit very hard. Gilchrist is a small town known for people who go out there to retire. So there's around 200 homes. And this, this, this hurricane came, hit, and swept everything on its way. People who came back after the hurricane said, that it looks like a place that never had houses here. And out of the 200 houses that, that, that got affected by this hurricane, one house stood firm. You see that picture over there? That is the same hurricane, the storm, that came across, but that house stood firm. If you ask the, land, the, the owner of the house, the owner would say, we went through the same storm before, and this time when we rebuild the house, we brought in the best architect, the best builders to make sure our foundation is strong, so no matter what storm that life brings in, we will stand firm. What I wanted to say this morning is that if you, if we can stand firm in faith in the word of God, no matter what the enemy throws in us, no matter what the storm is going through us, God will make us strong. During the last, after the Christmas, I went home, I got to hear the news that my dad was going through this. And after that, after the heart, he said, they said, there might be a problem of cancer. It, it broke us. My parents were saying to get into a cancer ward was a heartbreaking uh, feeling to get in. And, and I realized in that couple of nights I couldn't sleep. I was trying to draw, draw, what, what, what is going on? I prayed a lot of prayer. And, and the next day we, the next day my, we were talking on the phone, over the phone, my whole family. And the word of God, what he said strengthened us. And I want to say this, like, ever since that night, the night that we spoke with all of us together, my dad said, God spoke to him, bringing a word of God from the Gospel of John, saying, this disease will not be a disease to bring death, but to glorify God. And that just brought life and joy into our life. If I'm standing here with not being anxious or depressed of what was going on at home, the point where I, I feel so hard, I felt so hard doing, not knowing that I couldn't do anything. Being here, it's all because of God that the enemy will bring, oh, you've been serving God, you've been faithfully preaching, I'm speak, uh, doing ministry for God and still, the, still God gave you this disease. What do you think you are? But the God said, if you, when you stand firm on the faith, he will tell you, nothing formed against you shall prosper. What the enemy has meant for evil, he will make it for good. Everything that happens in your life is to glorify Jesus. So whatever is going through, Stand firm in your faith. Stand firm. There's an enemy that's going around devouring like a lion, looking who to attack. But when you stand firm, he will make you, he will establish you, he will make you strong. The standing firm that is used here is the same word used in Ephesians chapter 6. 
Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, <laughs> having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as, uh, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace that in, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can instantiate the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayers and supplications. I don't know about you, but all men here, have you ever gone outside forgetting to wear your belt? It's always a war, thinking you can never think straight. You're always pulling up your pants. You're always, especially when you lose weight, you just saying, uh, as a belt of truth, truth will fix your whole life. Because when you don't know the truth, it's easy for the enemy to attack. The belt of truth will put you together and ready to fight. And the breastplate of righteousness, righteousness means to be right with God, to remember that God has made you right with God. It's not by your work, it's not by your deeds, but by the grace of God. And with that breastplate, you, you, you protect your heart going for the war. And with the shoe of peace, you walk in peace towards things because you're not fighting against, 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 uh, against, against the rulers or, the, or, 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 or people, but against the the enemy that is working through them and the shield of faith, believing that God can do anything. Don't forget the truth that he can do, that God can do everything. And the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You can demolish any enemy that is coming to your way. I want to conclude with this verse, Zechariah chapter 4, where Zechariah is getting this vision from this angel. They, he's talking about Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was one of the uh, one of, uh, donors of Judah. And during the exile, the whole temple of, God, temple of God was demolished, right? The temple that Solomon built. And Zerubbabel came back to Judah to rebuild the temple. So he set the foundation for the temple. But because of a lot of um, adversities and all the struggles, he wasn't able to continue the building of the temple. He was put on halt. And Zerubbabel thought the enemy and I could never, never be able to finish this building. And people were against him for building because mainly because the temple that Solomon built was big and his building was smaller. People were fighting against him. And the Lord gives vision to Zechariah, saying, this is the vision to Sir Babel. Go and tell him. Verse 4, chapter 4, verse 4 to 7. And I said to the angel, talking about Zechariah, said to the angel who talked with him, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with him answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. And this is the word of the Lord to you. Not by might, nor by power, but my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain. And he shall, be, he shall, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shout of praise, praise to it. He's saying to Zerubbabel, you started something and the enemy has put a halt on it. And you feel like what you started is never, is, will never come to a complete. But God is assuring Zerubbabel 
that it's not by your might or by your power that you can finish this, but by the Spirit, says the Lord. The mountain that is standing ahead of you will grow as plain. I want to tell this this morning. I want to speak to you this morning that whatever you, in your life that it feels like halted, feels like the enemy has put a halt on it or put a pause on it, and you feel like whatever you try to do, I cannot complete it. I cannot come to finish what God has, I feel like God has given you a promise, but I feel like I'm in this area, in this season where it feels like I cannot move forward because of the mountain ahead of me, because of the mountain of problems ahead of me, mountain of anxiety, anxiety ahead of me, mountain of things that is impossible by me that I cannot move forward. But the Lord is telling you this morning, it is not by your might. Might means when people come together and do something towards something. And it's not by your power. Power, your power means by your own, but by the Spirit of the Lord. You see the mountain, you look at the mountain and say to the mountain that this will grow plain. And I will be able to walk straight into what God has called. Whatever it is, whatever it is in your life, God is asking you to look at the mountain and say the mountain, you'll be plain. Because God, what God has started in you, he will finish you and is faithful enough to finish you. Peter continues to say, and the God of all grace does all because of the grace of God who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a while will himself, say it with me, restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. I believe this word will, I pray that this word will Ignite your soul this morning, this new year, whatever you're going through. God knows because he cares for you. Let's close our eyes. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promise, Lord. We thank you you are faithful even when we are not. We thank you that you have called us to your eternal glory in Christ because of your grace not by our righteousness, not by our work or deed, what, uh, not by what we have done, but because of what you have done in us, that you sent your only son for us. Well, the more I think about it, the more it crushes me. Just as we sent this morning, just as I am. Lord, we were unworthy but you came for us. You said, cast all your cares because he cares for you. God, I pray for everybody who's here and everybody who's listening and everybody who's related to people here. God, I pray that you will reveal, Lord, that you will be comfort to those who are going through hardship. You will be, you'll be a father to them, a, a, a mentor, a leader to them, Lord. Someone to guide them, Lord. You are the light. And I pray that you will restore their soul. Make them strong, firm, and steadfast. That no one would be able to shake them. God, we surrender. We submit. We humble ourselves. And God, we stand firm in your promise and your word. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.